of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Uh -huh. And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, September 28th, 2023. My name is Emma Vigland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Packed show today on the program, Mark Beisinger will be with us to discuss his book, The Revolutionary City, urbanization and the global transformation of rebellion and later emily tamkin on her piece in the new republic why the gop fell in love with hungary and after that jamie peck back with us mm -hmm. to talk about cop city uh. yeah well <laughs> and her her efforts to change things on that front meanwhile the second republican debate happened last night you can check out our coverage see us a little tipsy um, it was somehow even more meaningless than the first one, but Ron DeSanctimonious finally said Trump's name, baby. Just in time for his poll numbers to dip once again. During the debate, Trump counter-programmed, spoke at a non-union parts manufacturer, and when mentioning the UAW, his primary focus was them not endorsing him. Speaking of the UAW, expanded strikes expected to be announced Friday. And McCarthy refusing to bring the Senate continuing resolution to the floor. So, government shutdown looking even more likely over the weekend. Judge Tanya Chutkin refuses to recuse herself in Trump's federal election case. After Trump's legal team cried about bias. Just look at her, okay? Hospitality workers in Vegas have overwhelmingly voted to authorize a strike. And sag after and the studios to resume talks next week after the writer's tentative deal. Senator Menendez and his wife plead not guilty on bribery charges. And The Intercept reports that communications between Menendez and Egypt look a lot like textbook intelligence source recruitment. Interesting. Our long national nightmare is over. The Senate now has a dress code, everybody. The family of uh, Eddie Ir Irizari, uh, sorry for butchering that, who the cops killed during a traffic stop, have filed a wrongful death civil lawsuit against Philly police. And lastly, Gavin Newsom signs a bill allowing for red state doctors to get abortion training in California. All this and more on today's Majority Report, or a majority Report as it's affectionately known. Whole crew with us here, uh, besides Sam, <laughs> Matt, Leck, Bradley. So surprisingly, we uh, we made it. You know, um, I almost I, decided against it. But, I, I yeah. this morning, you know, because I get up probably an hour and a half earlier when I host the show by myself because I just have a lot more like to do, and it was not the right time for us to have a late night with drinking involved i will just say yeah that. yeah yeah i'm not even really hung, hung over i'm just tired although maybe i'm just in denial about that yeah, yeah. i just guess with every year i i get older the the drinking and the night the day after it just gets worse um it's tough stuff i know well I, we didn't have our biotics uh free plug for them uh, let's let's talk a bit about uh yesterday so donald trump um, during the Republican debate after Biden went to the UAW picket line and actually stood with the workers who are striking. Um, it's a historic strike. It's the first time that um, the UAW has ever gone after the three major automakers at once. And as I said in headlines, it appears like Fain, um, absent some la last minute deal here, is announcing <clears throat> additional strikes happening on Friday as they continue to rightfully escalate their actions on this front. 
Um, Biden did that. It was a historic moment. First time a president has ever, uh, while they were in office, stood on a picket line, according to labor historians. But Trump decided he was going to do something with the aesthetic of <laughs> of of speaking to um, to auto workers, but not the union part, which is really the key the key element here. Um, this is Trump yesterday at the uh, at the the Drake Enterprises plant in Michigan. Again, this is a non-union truck parts manufacturer. That is not on strike. Yeah, that is not on strike. And Trump does mention the UAW at certain points, mostly just grievance that Sean Fain hasn't endorsed him, which is hilarious. But um, this was kind of the, the, the gist of what he had to or say. You, yeah. Or you've seen what happened where massive percentages of your industry went to other countries like Mexico, like China, like South Korea, like Japan. In other words, your current negotiations don't mean as much as you think. I mean, I watch you out there with the pickets, but I don't think you're picketing for the right thing. But if they endorse me, your leadership, you can tell them I said it, although I have a feeling they may be watching tonight. Because, you know, when Biden came here yesterday, they only had 11 people. I'll bet you we have 10,000 people standing outside. Right? I think we do. His crowd... That's size fixation continues to this day i don't know where he got those numbers and i couldn't that's why i support the mexican unions <laughs> who are standing in solidarity with the uaw leadership at this moment that's true that is true there was a great piece in in these times um where they they show how there is actually like international solidarity on this front which is really encouraging um but yes i mean that like it, it, the the dude is so disconnected from what these workers actually are fighting for. The only thing he can see is politics him. through is the prism of Trump. And um, I mean, like it, t to call him uh, self-involved would be a bit kind, <laughs> but that is his entire brand of politics. And um, this was uh, Nathan Stemple, the president of Drake Enterprises, the other day on uh, Bradley. Let's pull this up on on Fox News. And um, this kind of shed some light on maybe why Trump cho chose this, uh, this venue, why he decided to speak at this non-union parts manufacturer. Um, this is the guy who, who I guess was involved in coordinating it. He's the president of this, of this, uh, the, this company, basically. And um, he dances around a lot of things, and I'll decode it at the end. Bring in Nathan Stemple, the president of automotive manufacturing company Drake Enterprises, where former President Trump will be speaking tomorrow. Uh, Nathan, good morning to you. It's going to be a big week for you and your business because the <laughs> former president is coming uh, to speak at Drake Enterprises. Not every day you get a former president, current front runner, to visit. So give us the backstory here. Tell us how this visit came about and why you do want to host the former president. Well, first off, thanks for having me on. Um, it was complete luck. Um, some of our colleagues that we do business with reached out to us, um, said that the president was looking for a location to host this uh, event. Um, and, you know, we were more than willing to, to do so. Yeah, I'm sure you are more than willing. It sounds like a great opportunity. I'm sure you are. And uh, this is coming. The backdrop of this trip, of course, is the auto workers' strike, uh, which could drag on for a while. It's now expanded to 20 states. How does the strike impact your business? Uh, there's uh, several part numbers that we supply. We're a tier two, tier three supplier. In some cases, direct tier one. Um, but there are uh, parts that we supply that um, the demand has dropped off and. Um, you know, we're, we're not able to ship. We're still producing parts to, to create inventories and things like that and to keep our people um, working. But, um, you know, that's only going to last so long, depending on how long these uh, strikes go on for. Yeah, it certainly will. And that's why, Aww. you know, when we talk about how strikes impact the economy, uh, what you just said is a great example of that. Uh, President Biden is in a pretty tough spot because he is pushing electric vehicles while at the same time trying to support these union workers. And those two things don't really line up. If electric vehicles were going to take over today, how would that affect you? Oh, it affect us drastically. It put us out of business. 
Um, if electric vehicles took over today um, and completely across the board, um, we'd pretty much be out of business. We supply passenger vehicles, mostly all driveline components, um, as well as heavy duty truck components. So if all the trucks and vehicles went electric, um, we would be um, scratching for something to do. Yeah, so all those people all right, so in employ would, would lose their jobs? Is we, you heard that there, right? And, and again, I'll, I'll, let me decode this for you. Actually, let Alex Press, who if you aren't following Alex on social media, one of the best reporters covering uh, these strikes at this point. Over at Jacobin. Yep. Alex writes in Jacobin. Well, there you have it, all in a brief television clip. Trump's visit to Michigan is being coordinated by Michigan's non-union auto manufacturers, many of whom oppose the transition to EVs. So you heard that there. It would put us out of business, he said. That man. Part suppliers are particularly opposed, as an EV powertrain requires fewer parts than an internal combustion engine. Holding such a rally during a strike is the opposite of showing solidarity with union workers. The Republican Party's faux populist wing has been trying to convince the public that UAW members oppose it too, and this is a part of their reason for striking. It is not. Rather, it is a segment of auto manufacturers, i.e. the bosses, who object to EVs. The UAW doesn't oppose the transition. It merely wants it to be just with jobs in EV plants unionized. So that is the key there. His business is getting hurt because they're unable to produce uh internal combustion engines at the rates that they previously had for two reasons one because of the strike because there have been halts and work stoppages obviously and two because their very business model is under threat by the transition to electric vehicles so you can just see the incentives uh the perverse incentives here that someone like uh, uh you know trump is endorsing tacitly and uh, not so much by going to, to visit this non-union shop and speak there. And when he said, some of our colleagues that we do business with, um, what, what was the context of when he said that there? Some of the colleagues that we do business with? Um, oh, yes. Informing him that Trump wanted to hold a rally. Right. So that the ones that coordinated that. Uh, this is another sentence from what Alex wrote. Chris Marchioni, pro political director of the uh, International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, District Council uh, 1M in Michigan, told me that non-union auto manufacturers and the Trump campaign are being assisted in organizing today's rally by at least one lo longtime local activist in the state's right-to-work movement. That anti-union movement suffered a major defeat earlier this year when Michigan became the first state in years to repeal a right-to-work law, but it has no, uh, by no means ceased its efforts to disorganize workers and undermine their unions. So, like, when... The New York Times, for example, continues to say that Trump is visiting union workers, like I, the the photographer or auto workers or auto. I mean, that's it, what they like. It's not even the workers that are organizing this. These yeah. are bosses who are threatened by the EV transition. The fact that the EV transition includes uh, uh, would based on like what the UAW wants would include a unionized workforce that actually is paid a livable wage. They're the ones that are organizing Trump lending his, his platform to, uh, to basically non-union labor in this front. Yeah. That is what we're dealing with here. And so, like, I mean, I just couldn't believe that... I want to find this reporter's name here. What Do we have this, Bradley, this report, the, or the, the, the photographer? Oh. I mean, there, this was after essentially days of criticism days of criticism about the time specifically and other outlets reporting that this was union members doug mills at 10 17 p.m last night tweets real at real donald trump greets union members at drake enterprises in clifton uh, township michigan and i think nbc news reported that there were a few union members in the audience yes um, UAW. Uh, so people, that's what they're going to say. Like it's people that were Trump true. fans. Of course, that's the case. Of course, there are members of unions that are Republicans. I mean, that that it, I don't uh, understand it, but at the same time, it's just this complex tapestry in this country. Um, there may have been a few of them there, but that is so misleading to frame it as such because a majority of the people in the audience were not in U are not UAW members, and the people that organized this were 
obviously trying to diminish the power of unions. Yeah, I mean, the, the, they're going to continue to make that mistake because the corporate press resents that union speak for working people and they're going to false balance the idea that right to work will. So the, any sort of attempt they can to work that in, we, we cannot shame them out of this. This is a structural thing. But also there's another, because we let that a-hole talk on this program for probably longer than I would have liked. So I just want to read this from the Alex Press piece as well. As for Drake Enterprises, don't count on Trump, a guest of the non-union shop's boss, to criticize its working conditions, which appear to be dismal. The plan... The pay on Glassdoor listings for positions at the plant that do not require a college degree ranges from the mid 30,000 to 50,000 with poor benefits. And here's some comments on the site. One of the best places to destroy the confidence, morale, and enthusiasm of a human being. Turnover or is it turnover sickening? A tantrum driven adolescent mentality top boss. Now what I like, I mean that is poetry to me. A tantrum driven adolescent mentality top boss. You know that was written by a worker uh, who has been put through way too much by these a-holes. And yeah, they don't have a union because their workforce flips over too much. So uh, yeah, it's disgusting, but this is part of why it's a problem that capitalists run our press because they are going to do this and they're, they don't have labor reporters, but like, it's not just naivety. <clears throat> this is a choice that they're making to pre- pre- present this as balance as if there's a two sides to this issue here. But it's, that's even, but there's a lie at like when they both sides in the past, that was a lie by overemphasis or a lie by but this is overemphasizing those union work trump union workers for trump that go into that in this particular tweet but previously they just lied they just took the trump campaign's word for it that he was speaking to a unionized workforce when all the while a right right to work person is organizing this and this is done to literally break the backs of unions in this ev EV transition i just it's one of the most egregious like examples of media uh of the corporate press being the corporate press that i've seen in a really long time especially because they said that they learned a bunch of lessons from trump no yeah this is that trump is good for good for business Mm -hmm. yeah all right guys um a word from one of our sponsors before we speak uh to uh mark trust and will now you've heard about this before um uh, we build up our, our lives with bright moments of joy pride and success And however you define those moments, securing your future should be a part of that journey. Traditional estate planning can cost thousands of dollars and one size fits all templates may not capture all the important details of the life you've built. With Trust and Will, you can protect your legacy from the comfort of your home starting at just $159. Uh, Create your estate plan in minutes with Trust and Will. Like, you don't want to be caught without a plan if God forbid something happens. Trust and Will can help you with that. From maintaining control of your assets to easing the burden on your loved ones, an estate plan can ensure your family stays prepared and protected. Trust and Will has simplified the process of creating and managing your will or trust online, from finding out what's right for your family to finalizing documents with a notary. Each will or trust is crafted to be state-specific and customized to your specific needs. For example, care wishes, nominating guardians, final arrangements, and power of attorney, Helped loved ones avoid lengthy and expensive legal proceedings or having the state decide what happens to your assets. With Trust and Will, you can back your plan with support and peace of mind from estate planning experts. You can also prepare and organize your documents in all, all in one place for easy, everyday reference or emergencies. Trust and Will secures your information with bank-level encryption. Live customer support is available through the phone, chat, or email. Trust and Will is a name you can trust in online estate planning. Trust and Will has earned an overall rating of excellent with thousands of five-star reviews on Trustpilot. Hundreds of thousands of families and, and counting have used their expertise for estate planning. Gain peace of mind today with Trust and Will. Get 10% off plus free shipping of your estate plan documents by fun, uh, visiting trustandwill.com slash majority. That's 10% off and free shipping at trustandwill.com slash majority. Trustandwill.com slash majority. All right, guys, quick break, and then we'll be back with Mark uh, Beisinger.
are back and we are joined now by Mark Beisinger, uh, Henry W. Putnam Professor in the Department of Politics at Princeton University, author of The Revolutionary City, Urbanization and the Global Transformation of Rebellion. Mark, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Glad to be here, Emma. So uh, your book centers around the topic of revolution, you know, and it's kind of reorientation towards urban centers in, in the past you know, few few centuries, but you use this breadth of, of data and examples starting in 1900. So um, let's start really at the most basic level. What constitutes a revolution by your definition? Yeah, I define a revolution in much the same way that it seems to be defined uh, widely within the sociolo sociological and political science literature today. And that is as a mass siege of an established government uh, with the aim of bringing about regime change and some kind of uh, social or political change uh, in its wake. Right. So uh, protests um, don't necessarily constitute a revolution, right? Because there needs to be some sort of overthrow. That's well, or at least attempt to overthrow. Right. right? right. So uh, that's why I call it a mass siege. Uh, I mean, there are several purposes but of calling it a mass siege because a mass siege implies... Um, some kind of commitment to overthrow the government. It's not a one-off demonstration uh, calling for the government to resign. It's uh, going out and really showing conviction to try to overthrow a government. Uh, and also, uh, you know, one of the purposes of talking about it as a mass siege is to try to put unarmed and armed rebellion in, in the same conversation. Understood. And it also means that the it's a it's a mobilization of a population, right? Especially it's coming. It's not top down. It's bottom up. That's right. It's coming from from um, the population itself. They're trying to seize power to take back power uh, from, you know, a government that they are alienated from. And, and the urbanization of these revolutions is really so is super fascinating and I know <laughs> as central as it can be to your book um, and, and just how how cities are just intuitively centers of power. And so it makes sense that they would also be centers of revolution. Um, you talk about cities in this way as nerve centers, um, if you don't mind expanding a bit on that point. Yeah, it's where the... Uh, government centers of power are concentrated, where the decision makers are concentrated. It's where the coercive power of the state is concentrated. And generally, um, you know, the further you go away from cities, the weaker state penetration tends to be. And, so, and that, yeah. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. No, I, it just, it, and I never really thought of it uh, intuitively in that way, but how um, as cities and, and, and higher population centers begin to crop up as time goes on, it, it, it just makes the, the greatest sense in terms of coordination and coming together. Yeah, and urbanization brought large numbers of people in close proximity to these centers of power. And that's kind of the change that made possible all of these revolutions based on the power of numbers rather than the power of arms. So previously, uh, the power of arms was central to the revolutionary process, but today mobilizing very large numbers of people in central urban centers, uh, that's the main tactic that's being used. I, I was surprised to learn that, uh, you know, the re urban revolutions were um, beginning to, to crop up in the 18th and 19th centuries. But you talk a bit about how in the 20th century, that's when they started to get successful. Um, what is, what, what, uh, what are some of the impetuses or what's the impetus behind that uh, increase in success in the 20th century? Yeah, so revolution began as an urban phenomenon really. Uh, as an armed urban phenomenon, and uh, it migrated to the to the countryside in the mid twentieth century, largely because regimes uh, were better armed. Uh, they had more sold arm, armed soldiers, better trained soldiers uh, in cities, and so the success rate in the nineteenth century was actually pretty low for these urban revolutions. Um, so the migration of revolutions to the city over the, over the 20th century uh, caused revolutionaries to discover the peasant as a revolutionary force. But now, you know, in the late 20th century, where we have this massive urbanization, the world has gone, you know, from 1900 to about uh, 
uh, 13% urban to today where the world is a majority urban. Um, that concentration of people close to centers of power has really changed uh, the whole dynamic of revolution. Uh, cities have grown enormously. So these tactics based on the power of numbers couldn't have been carried out, let's say, in the early 20th century. It was just physically impossible to gather the large crowds that you would need in order to influence uh, a government, uh, which numbers in the hundreds of thousands. And even there, uh, you know, it's not always sure that you're going to win, but you have much better chances when you're able to mobilize large numbers in close proximity to centers of power. Yeah, I remember uh, having a conversation with somebody and I forget about, you know, why, um, uh, why communism, for example, in the United States, like the movements there and the organization there, it wasn't as salient as in some uh, European uh, uh kind of movements, right? And and part of it was because we were so much more spread out <laughs> during uh, during that time. And there were, uh, there was the ability, I guess, in in European cities to organize more effectively when um, the, when communism was was becoming a bit more organized uh, at that time. But I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm curious what uh, when, when you refer to in your book, uh, urban civic tactics in these revolutions and the imp incorporation of those, um, them in, in including a, a variety of different actions, including protests, but also including strikes um, and labor actions in different countries. Uh, how does that look? And can you talk a bit about that dimension? Yeah, usually uh, with these tactics, which really proliferated after the end of the Cold War or around right before the end of the Cold War. Um, these tactics mobilize very large numbers of people in central urban spaces, in the spaces between buildings, whereas the old revolutions used the physical um, landscape of the city, the buildings, uh, you know, they used the barricades. They tried to, to kind of use the city as rough terrain. Today, uh, revolutions uh, occur in open space. And one of the things that they try to utilize is that visibility. So they're trying to utilize their visibility in order to influence um, other people. Mass media makes a big difference. And of course, the, the rise of the internet increased visibility, it increased simultaneity. Uh, so uh, it's not only just the concentration of numbers in cities, there are other processes taking place as well. Um, the communications environment is, is one of them. Uh, but these urban, urban civic revolutions um, are usually highly coalitional. And they pull together people largely on the basis of uh, wanting to evict the government. Uh, but when you look at you know, the, the uh, attitudes and the preferences that people have within that crowd, uh, the people who participate, they're quite diverse. Um, so they come together in this kind of negative coalition uh, to try to evict the government. And uh, they come together very rapidly so these urban civic revolutions don't last very long. Uh, they're very compressed in time, uh, particularly when you compare them to rural-based revolutions. And they're compressed in time because, uh, you know, being in a city uh, is both dangerous to governments and dangerous, I mean, mo mobilization in, in, in the city is dangerous to governments and it's dangerous to, to uh, the rebellion, to, to those who are, who are rebelling. Um, so they don't last very long. There's a lot of, um, I guess, contingency that's built into them precisely because of this compressed nature. A lot of misinformation that goes, you know, uh, in, in terms of the interactions. So they're fundamentally different in many ways from what we know of revolutions in the past. Yeah, and you mentioned technology there and, and, and the, the more modern, you know, uh, uh, elements of, say, the Arab Spring, right, being um, uh, broadcast on social media and that having an impact. Um, but even if we go back to, obviously, uh, television, newspapers having photography and, and people on the ground, but you mentioned in your book the, the, uh, the, the promulgation of, of technology to amplify your voice, right? Uh, that, that having this impact and, and allowing for speeches and for voices to be heard. So that 
coincides quite nicely with this this 20th century boom in, in these kinds of revolutions. Exactly. I mean, in the 19th century, uh, speakers in revolutionary crowds couldn't be heard at more than about 10 meters. Uh, you know, there was no system of amplification of sound. You know, in the famous uh, Peterloo massacre that occurred in 1819 in, in uh, Manchester, uh, the fact that you couldn't hear uh, a speaker more than 10 meters played into all of that. Uh, it was a crowd of like 60,000 people, one of the largest crowds that occurred, um, you know, in England uh, during that period. So, uh, but in the, in, in the 20th century, you start to get sound amplification beginning around the 1930s. In fact, in, you know, it began in Nazi Germany for street rallies uh, organized by the Nazis. Uh, but then begins to be applied as a tool of challenging regimes. And so now you can have huge crowds where uh, people can actually, you know, be plugged into what's going on in a little bit more, uh, you know, systematic way. Right. I would also imagine that that impacts in a positive way the militancy of any of these groups because there's no telephone, uh, you know, the game of... of of communicating and things getting muddled, like it creates more direct, a, a, a more, more direct relationship between, say, somebody organizing revolution and somebody participating in it. Yeah, I mean, I think those 19th century revolutions depended upon small uh, recruitment of smaller groups uh, that were more tightly connected to, let's say, a factory or a neighborhood. Um, you know, they weren't pulling in large numbers of people from uh, the surrounding suburbs of, of, of a city, uh, they were much more localized. Uh, and you were absolutely right, more militant in a sense, because uh, they were more fragmented. They had many of these groups that came together. Um, and they were fra fragmented in, in, in uh, the sense that they couldn't coordinate uh, their tactics. Uh, today, you know, we, uh, as I mentioned, you have the negative coalition of lots of different types of people becoming involved with, with uh, revolutions based on the power of numbers. Uh, but there is coordination over the, over the tactics in a much more significant way. How, did, how does globalization and neoliberal politics play into this here and having an effect on revolution in cities? And, and for, I mean, obviously, a uh, We've ranted on the show before about some, you know, uh, some of these cities becoming like theme parks as opposed to livable spaces for human beings. But um, at that time of great of a great influx and, and great urbanization, um, these revolutions were also coinciding with uh, uh, global capitalism. Yeah. What what's your sense of how um, th those economic tides influenced this dynamic? Well, I think neoliberalism played into it in uh, two ways. First of all, it was associated with a massive expansion of cities and the concentration of people, power, and wealth in cities. Uh, so that was one one element of liberalization that uh, fed into the rise of, of these revolutions. But the other was, of course, uh, the fact that neoliberalism is all about contraction of the state, uh, you know, and um, by contracting the state, in many cases, not in all, but in many cases, uh, it helped to fuel uh, many of the demands that came up in these revolutions. So uh, not all revolutions emerge that way, not all of these urban civic revolutions emerge that, that way, but many of them do. Uh, so when you look, for instance, at the Arab Spring revolutions, that was certainly part of the dynamic, but it's part of the, it was part of the dynamic in other cases, um, Indonesia um, and uh, some of the, uh, East Asian revolutions and so on. So, what what's uh, how does the impact of outside superpowers, say the United States, maybe <laughs> influencing uh, some of this these revolutions through yeah. money and through uh, you know kind of uh, in, intelligence operations? How, how does that how does that fit into the analysis of whether things are organic or not? You know, in your extensive study of this. Well, it plays into it, obviously, because I think it becomes, uh, I, I don't, I'm not talking so much about, uh, well, surreptitious support, but money, giving 
resources to opposition groups and so on, um, you know, that certainly plays into the ability of groups to, to mobilize. However, uh, you know, I do want to emphasize that you can't manufacture millions of people on the street. Uh, you know, they're there for reasons, uh, and those reasons, uh, you know, emerge uh, largely because of corrupt and uh, repressive government. So most of these revolutions occur, uh, these urban civic revolutions occur in regimes that uh, where the leader has been in power for a very long time. Uh, they're heavily corrupt. They're uh, highly repressive. Um, you know, they're kind of in the middle range uh, in terms of GDP. They're not too wealthy, but they're and they don't have oil resources typically uh, to be able to you know buy off population uh, rebellion. Uh, but so there are real grievances, you know, that are at the base of these revolutions that can't be manufactured uh, right. by by outside powers. So, I mean, you know, we shouldn't necessarily think that uh, an outside power is pulling the strings. And this is true also, I should say, in the Cold War period. So obviously the Soviet Union aided, um, you know, social revolutions uh, around the world. It didn't manufacture them. Mm -hmm. It aided them. Um, so geopolitics plays into revolutionary processes. It's a factor that influences them and, 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 and shapes the possibilities and opportunities that are out there, but it can't manufacture revolution. Understood. Yeah, it it's it. We know. I, I think that the you you can manufacture assassinations like the the that CIA you can manufacture. That's yes, right. 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 <laughs> so you can manufacture. Who's who's you can manufacture? But revolutions are a lot harder to man manufacture from outside. That that's I think a, a, an important distinction to draw. Um. It, as we kind of wrap up here, I also found it fascinating how there was a shift in the 20th century um, in the, the the kinds of regimes um, that were subjected to social revolution, right? Um, and, and if you could describe that shift, right, um, ver uh, when, when it became um, more about some of those repressive uh, despots and dictators that you describe there, yeah. Um, so, at, versus the beginning of the twentieth century. Yeah, I mean, I think at the beginning of the twentieth century, um, issues of poverty, land uh, inequality, uh, access to land in this you know predominantly peasant world, uh, those were the issues that were animating revolutions, uh, and you know what were known as social revolutions, because they've, I mean, although we have some social revolutionary episodes that are still, um, you know, continuing today, they've largely become marginalized uh, in the world. Uh, they've become much less frequent. Um, and we haven't had new ones emerge in a long time. So the ones that are out there, uh, they've just festered along for a long time. Uh, people have found other ways to press these demands about inequality. But the the, the uh, urban civic revolutions don't depend on peasants. Uh, they depend on ur the urban classes and disproportionately urban middle classes who are in close proximity to the state. It's not that economics don't play a role and economic inequality uh, doesn't play a role. It does. But the predominant demands happen to be uh, focused around corruption, uh, around re the repression of the state. And uh, these are cross-class coalitions, uh, broadly cross-class, uh, but disproportionately middle class. So um, you know, relative to the num their numbers in, in society. So, uh, you know, that uh, phenomenon um, has, uh, has meant that um, these Revolutions are much less ambitious uh, than hmm. you know the early social earlier social revolutions. They're just not trying to transform society in in the same way. And, and so then that kind of leads us to the the final question here: What is the future of revolution given the circumstances that you describe? Because yeah, I million, mean, it's necessary. I mean, we're 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 living in a time of extreme wealth inequality globally, um, yeah. and and a bunch of other corrupt governments as well. Yeah, exactly. Revolution's not going to disappear. Revolution has always been an evolving phenomenon, and it has changed over time. It's been put put to many different purposes. 
uh, purposes of uh, not only you know attacking class inequalities, but attacking corrupt and and repressive governments, uh, attacking uh, states that are uh, you know holding ethnic groups uh, captive, or uh, you know anti-colonial revolutions, Islamic revolutions. Uh, there are many different types of revolutions that have been out there. So revolution could be repurposed uh, uh, in, in certain ways. Right now, social revolutions you know, have become marginalized, but that doesn't mean that it might not happen in the future, given that inequalities still um, you know, not only persist, but they've gotten worse, particularly in cities. Now, that, had, that mode hasn't yet been invented. Mm. Uh, it would probably have to rely on the power of numbers. Uh, which will have certain dynamics to it. Um, you know, people now have been pressing, I would say, those those types of issues more through the ballot box than through revolution. But one can imagine in a world of democratic backsliding, in particular, that, uh, you know, trying uh, populations trying to reassert control over states, particularly, let's say, if January 6th had worked, uh, yes. we don't know what kind of world we we would live in. Revolution right. could become something imaginable. So, uh, but backsliding is is a factor that could affect the future of revolution. The other, you know, thing is that the 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 far right, ha, you know, uh, there have been relatively few revolutions utilized by the the far right, but that could also become, you know, a a possibility. So, you know, revolution is always evolving and and changing. Uh, so we should expect that to happen in the future too. Uh, Mark Beisinger, uh, professor at Princeton University, author of The Revolutionary City, Urbanization, and the Glo uh, Global Transformation of Rebellion. We will put a link to your book uh, wherever people are listening to or watching this and at majority.fm. Mark, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, guys, quick break. And when we come back, uh, we are going to be talking to Emily Tamkin about the Republican Party's obsession with Hungary. <laughs> We are back and we are joined now by uh, Emily Tamkin, journalist, author of the books The Influence of Soros and Bad Jews, uh, here to discuss her piece in The New Republic, Why the GOP Fell in Love with Hungary. Uh, Emily, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Of course. Thank you for having me. So uh, the Republican Party has this budding love affair with Viktor Orban and um, the, the far right leader of, of Hungary. I guess it's not as budding as I thought because you uh, write about how it goes back a little bit further than some people might realize. But um, just tell the audience a bit about who Orban is before we we dive into some of those ties. Mm -hmm. uh, Viktor Orban is the prime minister of Hungary and has been for quite a while now. He was in power, then out of power, and then has been been in. Um, and I think it's important to note that that this his attempts to reach the Republican Party really started when he was um, when he was out of power and trying to separate himself or, or tried to sort of distinguish himself from the party in power, not by saying, hey, I have a fondness for Putin and strong men as well, which is sort of the tack that that he takes today, um, but by saying, look, I'm, I'm transatlanticist like you, and which is sort of where the Republican Party was at the time. Mm. The reason I stress this is that, um, as some of your listeners may know, Orban and Fidesz really first became known in Hungary during the late 80s when he was really pro-democracy and, and sort of a a freedom fighter. And I, I think it's important that we see this um, this common thread of Orban really telling his audience what he thinks they want to hear at the time that they that he has sort of thinks they want to hear it. Um, so he, he makes these this sort of outreach effort. And then that doesn't really go so well. Um, but then Trump comes on the scene and Orban is already back in power. He's already starting to talk about illiberal democracy. You know, he's rewriting Hungarian history such that 
Um, Hungary has never done anything wrong. It's just been victimized. It's, you know, the politics of grievance, which is sort of of a piece with what Republicans here Certainly, are doing. Certainly, yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, he finds a really, uh, you know, he, he finds this audience in Trump, um, particularly once Trump is, is in office, he gets a White House visit. Um, you know, he finds an administration that that sees sort of flirtations with with Putin and thinks like, OK, you know, we, we want to we, we still want to work with you. Um, and, and really, we've seen that that sense. And it's it's transcended Trump. Um, you know, I think now they're all in on him as the candidate. But you saw some outreach efforts to Ron DeSantis and to his camp. Um, CPAC, the conservative conference, uh, you know, went to Budapest. Um, and what I try to get across in this piece is that this is really sort of beneficial for both sides, so much so that they paper over what are actually some very real differences that I think sometimes we ignore when talking about this alliance. I, I mean, <clears throat> one of the similarities that just sticks out to me immediately is the anti-Semitism mm -hmm. um, and and the, the fixation on Soros in particular. I understand that I, Soros is Hungarian, if I'm not mistaken, right? Exactly. He, he was born in Hungary. He survived yeah. um, the Nazis and the Arrow Cross and left during the socialist era. Um, but he's, he's originally Hungarian and actually his first um, open society's first really concerted efforts were in Hungary and he's been there for the last or that's been there for the last like 40 years. Um, and when when Orban came back to power, you know, there there had been conspiracy theories about Soros before, um, but he really doubles down and 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 pushes this idea that Soros is flooding the country with migrants and Soros wants to, you know, degrade the Hungarian nation. And of course, you know, we and not that we again, not that we hadn't heard such conspiracies before, but really in an amplified, sustained way once for the past really five years. Yeah, um, abs yeah absolutely. I think that's that's a really important link through line. Out. Yeah. And, and it's super key, I think, to understanding this, because this is just a laundering of great replacement theory through anti-Semitism. Right. And, and you see this on the on the right in particular uh, in, in the U.S., where um it, it, black people are, are coming to take your jobs or Mexicans are coming to take your jobs, but they uh, they don't have the uh, puppet master uh, abilities that someone like Soros would if you catch my drift. Mm -hmm. He's the one who is getting all the, the, the these hordes of, and again, I'm speaking in their voice here, right. hordes of people to come and ruin your life because he is the mastermind. Um, that is completely identical to a lot of things that we hear from elected Republicans in yep. the U.S. And then, of course, on uh, the now canceled Tucker Carlson <laughs> program, who's referenced in this piece, given his reverence uh, for for Orban. I think it's a really important I mean, I, I just think that it's it's so important to stress because it really speaks to the core of the political projects and what they have in common, which is we get to decide who the nation is, right? We get to say who the real Hungarians are. We get to say who the real Americans are. We, the politicians, are the only ones who can protect you. And there's this nefarious element in our midst um, that would degrade and corrode the nation from within. And we're the ones who are going to protect you from that. Now, you don't, I didn't just say the word, I didn't say the word Jewish just then, but these tropes are so baked <laughs> yeah. into our political consciousness that, right, that that, that you, your anti-Semitic synapse lights up when I say like, you know, this rootless force that's trying to um, to degrade the nation by bringing in, you know, by and, and, and is seeking to replace you. Um, it's anti-Semitic, it's xenophobic, it's racist. And it also makes for a society that cannot trust itself, that cannot trust its sense of self, because there's always this greater force that's threatened, that's that's looking to sort of pull one, pull one over on you. Um, and the politicians set themselves up as the, really the only ones who can be trusted to protect you from that. Yeah. And in that sense, it's completely anti-democratic. And it, yes. it's a very, very convenient uh, situation for a strong man like Orban, where mm -hmm. you can just essentially say, well, I am the one I am the one singular person who can bring our sense of national identity back against the corrupting influence of the non-nationals who may look a little differently than you, um, I guess, which does bring me to to his tenure um, as the leader of Hungary. I mean, what are some of the hallmarks of what he he has um, implemented, given the fact, I, I guess he, he cut his teeth in, in opposition, but you, he, he seemed to have tested out a bunch of different things, saw what works, and now he's one of the most um, notable far-right leaders of this ilk in the world. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's sort of wild when you think about, like, why are we talking about about Hungary as often as we are, right? And I don't mean to sort of knock Hungary, but it's a relatively small, relatively poor country in Central Europe 
but and he has managed to get an outsized international influence by by pushing these theories. So he, you know, it's it's the rewriting of history in which, um, and when Trump did a similar thing, right? There are, there are American politicians who who have pushed a similar vision in which you and your supporters have done nothing wrong ever. You've only been taken advantage of and so on and so forth. So it's the rewriting of history. It's the attack on education, um, either pushing universities like CEU and Budapest, which Soros founded largely out of the country um, or trying to sort of take over different institutions. Um, it's the attack on, on migrants and asylum seekers and on NGOs that would help them. Um, it, it's, it's, saying that a family doesn't involve any LGBTQ people mm. and that, and that, you know, that teaching that there are people who are LGBTQ, that that it's in, its, in and of itself is a crime. Um, and I also think there's another parallel that sort of, that, that I think is sort of, sort of fits, which is that Hungary is able to do this in part because it exists within the structure of the EU. So as much as Orban rails against the EU, Hungary is as, um, you know, as, as financially secure as it is, as politically influential as it is in large part, because it has this, larger, like, you know, I mean, you can debate Bodyguard. whether or not they, exactly, exactly. And you can debate whether the EU is democratic, but it does, you know, it does have certain standards of rule of law and liberalism. To me, it's sort of similar to, you know, I spoke to one person in the piece who compared it to US states in the 19th and mid 20th century that were anti-democratic, but existed within this larger democratic structure of the US. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think that you could make that parallel today. Right. I think there Definitely. are I think yeah. there are governors today who sort of act like mini Orbans, where, you know, it's an attack on rule of law. It's an attack on democracy. But they have these sort of semi but they're able to do it because they will take within. your disaster aid, for example. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, <laughs> you you mentioned CPAC there. I think this is a good opportunity to talk about, you know, Matt Schlapp and CPAC and some of the conservative um, uh connections that are are not you know just uh ideological but tangible with orban and conservative groups in the united states if you don't mind talking a bit more about that no of course i think yeah i think some of it is just sort of their ideological bedfellows but we should say that there are individuals who go back and forth between these two places you know hungary hired former florida congressman connie mack to lobby for fidesz in the for hungary in the united states um cpac is a convening of of conservative figures, and they had Hungarians and Americans together. Um, MCC, the Matthias Corvinus Collegium, is a is a private institution in Hungary um, that you know Balas Orban no relation runs that that is sort of meant to be another convening spot of these American and Hungarian conservatives. Um, other figures, Arthur Finkelstein, who is was a, a Republican operative from New York, um, met Orban. Uh, through Netanyahu, actually, and sort of was one of the people who who came up with the like the re um, the reanimated Soros conspiracy theory. So there are individual figures who sort of have you know work as as touch points um, between Hungary and the United States, um, and they really tout you know I I, I talk in the, I write in the piece about why like why and I, I think for American conservatives they're not actually concerned about the reality of Hungary right there you know if it's what life is actually like for people there, that doesn't matter to them. It's it's sort of a, a projection. It's it's a place that they look to as this white Christian, you know, this is pure in a way that our country is not. Mm. And for the and for Fidesz, it's great. You're getting attention from one of the two major parties of the most powerful country in the world. Like you're you're at the table. Why wouldn't you want that? And so because of that, the two will, you know, I, I write in the piece that actually there are some ways in which they're not so similar, right? Like you could not even question the right to an abortion in Hungary. It's not even, the people I spoke to for this piece explained, it's not even like a political stance. It's just not something that mm -hmm. would occur to them. Um, it's, you know, it, it, Hungary provides very generous um, childcare. Now that is because they're pushing natalist policies where women are expected to have multiple children. Right. But right. there's a whole social safety net that goes along with that, that most people in the Republican party don't want to provide. So there are these very important differences that both sides, because it's so mutually beneficial to say that they have this alliance, right. For the projection or for the, you know, the, the sort of boost, um, they'll pretend that those aren't real. Well, uh, it, it also it, they do have generous child care, but that's only for straight people. I mean, and it's exactly. it's it, this is a, a, also a hallmark of, of Orban's, um, I would say, political identity is like I don't in, in the United States. There are differences in that um, you might hear Josh Hawley say something like this or you might hear, um, 
you know, whatever the other dude, uh, 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 Tom Cotton, the fascist yeah. or whatever, like they, <laughs> um, they, they might say something similar, but they're never going to implement some right. sort of, uh, of, of child care policy, even that's incredibly discriminatory towards LGBTQ people because they they answer to to big donors and they don't want a social right. safety net that's going to cause them some some tax dollars. So I think that distinction is, is different. Right. Or, or <laughs> that that was redundant. I think that distinction is important. Yeah, but I, I agree with you that it's 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 also important not to pretend that like it's it's because they're so wonderfully supportive of all different kinds of families, right? It, it's still it's still in service of a political project. Um, the end goal of that political project is not so different from the Republican political project, but you know, Hungary and the United States are actually not the same. And so to get there, they're they are pursuing very different, very different policies. And it's, you know, uh, yeah, you you hear every now and again some figure on Fox say, oh, we need to like uh, sort of gets at a child tax for but, but when push comes to shove, the Republican Party does not actually support that um, right at all and it doesn't matter how many events about like oh the precious family they co-host with hungarians in dc they have not fundamentally changed their policies to reflect budapest policies um th there's also this fixation on the christian family as a unit mm -hmm. um so there the the where there is overlap is this kind of christian nationalism um what does that look like in hungary yeah i mean it, i think it makes life very difficult for people who are not straight or christian or who don't want to have children or who don't, you know, who, who sort of don't, I, I think it's, it's quite, um, I think it's quite limiting mm -hmm. unless, unless you, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are supports in place if you sort of fit into that vision. And if you don't, um, you know, it's, it, 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 there's, it, there's, there isn't that same support for you. It's more limited into it, the, the imagination as to what your life could be. Um, it's more limited. And I also think we should, we should say that like, if you're a religious or ethnic minority, you know, I'm talking sort of about like maybe you're a mom and you don't want to have four children. There's pressure on you. But if you are Jewish or you are Muslim or you're, you know, you're from a different yeah. country or you're there's there's actual there's actual pressure on you. You know, I, I have been reporting on this for several years now and I've noticed that in the NGO space, it's in, to a certain extent, it's gotten harder to find people to speak to because you know, particularly when it's about Soros, just because it's become so politically toxic. Um, it's become it, it, just any connection with the name has, has brings so much pressure onto the people who are trying to do things like make life a little more bearable for gay people, right? Mm -hmm. or, or provide some aid to asylum seekers. Um, and I, I think that's the reality of saying, oh, we're building an illiberal Christian democracy. Uh, lastly, before I let you go, Emily, I, I, you talked about natalism, and I, I've been I've been trying to sound the alarm about that on this show for a little while because I mean, for the richest one of the richest men on earth, Elon Musk is an open mm -hmm. natalist. Um, what does that really mean, and what does that look like in practice, and why is it a focus of the far right? Yeah, I, I mean, we could big question. Whole, yeah, 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 yeah. But I think. You know, I, I think really it comes down to seeing women as nothing more than it, it goes to seeing women as not fully human, mm -hmm. right? Like fundamentally, it says, it says that a woman is a vehicle to have as many children as she can have, regardless of what this would do. Forget her career, what this would do to her health, what this would do to the rest of the family, what this would do to her as an individual um, or any person who wants to have children. Yeah, um, I think it's a very it's a very productive, it's a very regressive view of what a person's life can be or has to be or should be. That's not to knock having children. That's not to knock having a family. That's not to knock having a big family. But it is to say, it is to knock um, not having a choice in doing any of those things, right? And saying that the only way that you can really be a citizen, the only way that you can really be a part of a country as a woman or as a person who, who you know, could have children is to is to have four kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it strips your humanity and it strips your in a way, I don't want to sound melodramatic, but it really strips your citizenship because all of a sudden the one way that you can participate in the demos, right, is to bear children. Yeah. Um, so that's why I think it's, that's why I think the far right likes it. And that's why I agree with you that it's, it's that people who believe in democracy um, and it's in its most robust form should be wary of it. And especially because it's, it often uh, really crosses over with uh, it just being the reproduction of white babies as opposed yes. to <laughs> i mean 
all of these things are really connected, right? Like the anti-Semitism is connected to xenophobia and to yeah. racism, which is in turn connected to fear of losing, I don't know, pure white people, which is in turn connected to natalism, which is in turn connected to the anti-Semitism, right? Like I, I often say you, you have to, you have to look at these things in concert because that's how they work. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's all, it, it's, and, and the reason, you know, and there are many things to criticize about Soros, but I think one of the reasons that he is such a frequent target of people with this political vision is that an open society is one in which no matter your gender, your race, your religion, your whatever, you are equally entitled to take part in discussion and debate and to try to shape society. And that is what is directly counter to the vision of these politicians. And that is what the Hungarian, what Fidesz and the US right has in common right now. Um, they want to close society. And all of these policies are to further that. Uh, Emily Tamkin, journalist, author of the books The Influence of Soros and Bad Jews. Uh, the piece is called Why the GOP Fell in Love with Hungary. It's in the New Republic. We'll put a link to that and everything else in the description wherever you are listening to or watching this. Uh, Emily, thanks so much for your time today. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right, guys, really quick break. We have a third guest. Can you believe it? And it's a special one returning to the show, Jamie Peck, to talk about Cop City. Be right back. We are back and we are joined now by uh, none other than Jamie Peck back with us. Hello, Jamie. Hey, it is nice to be back. Oh, yeah. Well, you were on when I wasn't here. So I figured that we had to, to do a, a follow up, uh, you know, when when D D Sam is Sam's not around, you know, just I so was also gone. It was COVID week, right? Oh, that was yeah. COVID week. Uh, all right. All right. Well, yeah, I'm not sure if you heard, but the. <laughs> COVID hit the office and only Bradley survived. So uh, we uh, we all got it. It was not not the most fun. Oy. Yeah, um, I've had it once so far. Hope I don't get it any more times than that. Knock on wood. But everyone's yeah, getting it their second time right oh. about now. So you better <laughs> oh look yeah. out, Jamie. Yeah. Well, good thing I'm not uh, putting myself around lots of people in enclosed spaces or anything. Yeah, right. As you're definitely not doing any organizing uh, in Atlanta. I mean, tell us a bit about that. How's how's the uh, the organ organizing going in opposition to Cop City? So what I'm doing right now and why that was a funny little joke was <laughs> I am on a speaking tour. Um, oh. Although I should note that a lot of these places, everyone's wearing a mask. So that's very nice. And uh, it makes me feel better because if I get COVID, I will have to probably cancel the rest of these tour <laughs> dates that I have. Um, the speaking tour is in service of a new direct action that we are planning called Block Cop City. Uh, you want to know a little bit about that? Oh, I do. <laughs> I do. So, um, Hmm. Maybe I should start with a bit of background. I'm not sure how familiar your viewers are with uh, the fight over Cop City. I know we, you've we, talked about it a little bit. We have, but we I think everybody could anyone, use yeah, a, a refresher. In. Yeah. So Cop City is a hundred million dollar police training facility that they are trying to build. Um, they're going to cut down the forest in Atlanta to do it. Um, this will be a place where the cops from Atlanta and all over the country and even places as far flung as Israel are going to train in basically urban warfare tactics using all the latest military technology to suppress uh, popular uprisings among civilian populations. Um, now, how do we know that they're thinking about it this way? Um, they're thinking about it certainly in a national context. Um, the plans to build Cop City kicked into high gear in 2021. 
Now, we all know what happened in the summer of 2020. That's right. We had the George Floyd uprising, one of the biggest popular uprisings of all time in U.S. history, if not the biggest. Um, so they are thinking about it very much in connection to that. And so should we. So this is not just an issue that affects people in Atlanta, although it certainly affects them the most, especially with the ecological importance of this forest. Um, we've got folks saying that the air quality in Atlanta would be substantially worse if they cut down this forest. Um, other experts saying the flooding in Atlanta would be even worse than it is right now if they cut down this forest. So again, you really see how the, uh, the abolitionist movement and the movement to uh, protect the earth, save the world from climate change um, are are converging right now in this moment in a very exciting and important way. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, can, can you expand a bit more on the on the, the backlash element? Just the, the fact that basically the police state uh, saw these popular uprisings, nothing substantive from a federal level changed. Uh, there was no legislation that was passed in the wake of this uh, that, that, that actually defunded or restricted police activity. In fact, the Democratic president uh, at one one point during his his State of the Union said fund them more, basically. Uh, so there has been not except on, you know, some city and municipal levels, a ton of movement on this front. And yet this cop city construction basically seems like a way to just say, don't even try it because we're going to expand. Yeah, for sure. I think it's uh, an expansion of the police state at all costs. And it is a facility that's going to further militarize the police. So um, the movement is at an interesting phase right now. Um, I feel like I'm giving a little version of my presentation in miniature, which is All right, I'm just getting, a teaser. Yeah, I'm getting I'm getting real good at this. Um, <laughs> so the movement has been through many different phases. Um, it's an extremely broad movement with lots of different groups and lots of different people involved. It's um, decentralized and autonomous. So there's not one person, uh, despite what the RICO indictments might weirdly claim, <laughs> there is not one leader who does not come into the forest who's telling <laughs> everybody else what to do. I'm like, what the fuck are they talking about? Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are lots of different groups involved, um, working sometimes together, sometimes just in parallel um, towards the same goal, but perhaps for different reasons. I think um, that's one strength of the movement. Um, my comrade Hugh wrote a really good thing for Ill Will Editions, actually, on the strategy of composition um, as opposed to coalition, which is to say um, there can be lots of different groups working for similar goals, but they do not have to necessarily come to any kind of practical unity about their politics or their mass line. And we've seen so many different tactics in this fight from um, there was an encampment, a very strong, hearty encampment set up for uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, it was cleared a few times and we came back a few times as well. But um, that phase of the movement is currently kind of over, although it might come back. Um, there have been some uh, events with children, events with clergy, religious events, really fun events for the whole family. Um, there have been <laughs> some music festivals. Uh, the cops actually raided one of the music festivals during the mark week of March week of action, which I was at, um, started arresting people just for being there and charging them with terrorism, which well, is... Well, they're racketeering, obviously, you know, listening to music. No one... Uh, they, apparent, I mean, just talk a bit more about those RICO charges, because it's just so absurd. It, um, the, it, the In the wake of what we saw, you know, Trump and, and company being charged with, with RICO, like, it's almost as if that cachet from that political moment was used then just immediately against leftist activists who are trying to change things in the state of Georgia. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've got no great love for Trump, but uh, <laughs> these kinds of laws, these kinds of charges are much more likely to be leveled against um, leftist activists than anyone. Um, the three RICO cases in the Georgia AG's office right now are actually Trump, Young Thug and us. So we're in some good company. Obviously, <laughs> we stand with Young Thug and the whole Young Slime Life crew, um, <laughs> Trump, uh, we do not stand with Trump, but um, these are just, I mean, these are charges that are, they're- If Trump they're wants to become an abolitionist, you know, if, and, you know, join right. Cop City of maybe go into the forest himself and, you know, start camping out there, then, you know, any, hey, anybody can change and be welcome into this composition. <laughs> sure, sure, within reason. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, these are charges that are supposed to be used against the mafia. 
So it is very strange and absurd to watch them be used against forest defenders, most of whom, uh, I mean, many of whom don't even believe in the capitalist system. So uh, this is clearly not a way that we're trying to like do crimes and make money. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, the state uses all the tools at its disposal. So, um, yeah, the repression has been pretty bad thus far. Um, the RICO charges, I think 61 people are now facing RICO charges. Um, at least 40 people are facing domestic terrorism charges. Um, three people are facing uh, felony intimidation charges for flyering with the names of the cops that shot Tortuguita. And of course, what I'm referring to is in January, um, the cops killed a forest defender who, according to the autopsy, was sitting cross-legged in their tent with their hands in the air like this. And I don't, I don't know if we're ever going to find out exactly what happened. There conveniently were no witnesses around when they did this, but um, it was a multi-agency raid. Um, they claimed that Tortuguita shot first, but that's obviously bullshit because according to the autopsy that came out later, they were sitting on the ground with their hands in the air. Once yeah. again, um, there was no gunpowder residue found on their hands, which would have been true if they had shot the cops. There's also a police officer uh, on a body cam footage speculating about whether the wounded officer, because there was one officer wounded, was shot by another cop mm -hmm. because there were so many different kinds of cops involved in this raid. And they shot Tortuguita at least 57 times. Um, yeah which is horrendous, uh, obviously. But since then, um, Tort's family has come from Venezuela to the U.S. Um, their mom, Belkis Tehran, as well as their father and brother have come to the U.S. Uh, trying to get justice for their child and joined the movement and carried on the fight that Tortuguita was very much involved with. So that's been really nice to see yeah that that's beautiful and like conveniently it, my recollection is that the uh the the body cam footage was is not available for the actual shooting just the the piece of information that we got after about tortuguita uh being killed um talk, talk a bit about the the referendum um and how there, you know, uh, organizers submitted like what 116,000 signatures, way more than were were needed to get it on the ballot, and yet the powers that be in Atlanta um, and, and city officials are trying to stamp that out. Uh, wh what's going on there? Yeah, so one arm of this movement has been a very powerful referendum campaign to get a referendum on the ballot to let the people of Atlanta actually vote as to whether or not they want Cop City built. Now, the people who live in the neighborhood right around Cop City, it's a black working class neighborhood, um, technically don't even get to vote in the city of Atlanta. They don't get to vote for city council and they are not eligible to sign the petition. So there is no accountability to the people who will be affected the most. However, um, the people in the rest of Atlanta don't want this thing either. And the city doesn't want to let them vote on it because they know that if they actually let the people vote, they will vote no. Um, so yeah. I think 120,000 people have signed this petition in order to get the referendum on the ballot. Um, this is a historic first in the city of Atlanta. You need 50,000 petition signatures in order to get a referendum on the ballot. And it comes with all sorts of zany restrictions, like you have to be a resident of Atlanta proper, uh, even though there are several counties that actually make up metropolitan Atlanta and it could be five minutes away, but you're not eligible. Um, you have to be a registered voter and you have to have voted in the last election. Um, with all those restrictions, even so, at least one in five Atlanta residents signed this petition. It's a very small city. Um, that's more than twice the number of people who voted for Mayor Andre Dickens in the last mm. election. So even if some of these signatures are invalid, even if some of these signatures are going to get thrown out um, and they are using a voter suppression tactic called signature matching, where if your signature doesn't exactly match your signature that they have on file, uh, maybe you had a baby on your hip, maybe you were holding some groceries, uh, you're shit out of luck. Uh, there are probably some signatures from people who don't live in uh, Atlanta proper as well, but we know that we definitely have way more than we need. Right, you have um, a huge cushion. Yeah, so the state is trying everything in its power to uh, make sure this doesn't happen. It was supposed to happen in November, 
And the block cop city action that I'm about to tell you about was planned for November to coincide with the referendum, but the city has gotten it pushed back to March and I'm sure they're gonna keep on trying that forever. Um, this may have been a tactical move on their part because the Republican primary is also gonna be in March. So maybe they think that um, more conservative voters, yeah, more that makes law sense. And order types who love the cops are gonna come out for that. Um, but if anything, I think this highlights the need for some form of direct action uh, to go along with this um, working from within the system. And I think um, a lot of people who volunteered to canvas for the referendum initially are becoming radicalized in real time and really converging on uh, the need for something else. So let's talk then about that action, blockcopcity.org. That is the website, and we will put that in the description uh, wherever you're listening to or watching this. But um, what's happening uh, with Block Cop City? So Block Cop City came out of some meetings that we had during the last week of action in June. Um, it was a less eventful week of action than the one in March, and we saw certain tactics becoming exhausted, at least, um, you know, for the present moment. We needed a way out of this um, this sort of interesting uh, conundrum, this, this interesting confluence of circumstances that we have right now, where on the one hand, more people than ever know about Cop City, more people than ever oppose Cop City, you saw we just talked about how many people signed the petition to get the referendum on the ballot. On the other hand, the repression has been so bad and so absurdly outsized to what, you know, even mainstream legal scholars find appropriate for um, this kind of activism. The repression has been so bad, so violent at times that um, people are afraid to show up and do any kind of embodied action. And, you know, I get it. It's really scary. So um, we were trying to find a way out of this bind and make people feel like they could come and do direct action, like they could do embodied action again um, in Atlanta. And we wanted to create a really easy on-ramp for people who've maybe never even done something like this before. Um, so what we came up with, what we've sort of converged upon is um, a nonviolent act of civil disobedience sort of in the mold of the anti-nuclear movement of the 60s and 70s that had a number of successful occupations of sites where they're trying to build uh, environmentally hazardous nuclear plants, um, certainly in the mold of the civil rights movement, which has a very deep legacy in Atlanta. So basically what's gonna happen is people from all over the country are gonna come to Atlanta, the we uh, Veterans Day weekend, which we chose because it's, um, a three-day weekend, people have an extra day to travel, but it's not a religious holiday. Well, it might be for some, but uh, <laughs> not for most. And uh, people don't really have to do much that weekend. They can just come on down to Atlanta. Um, we're asking people to form affinity groups, which is just kind of a buddy system for travel, for decision-making, for making sure that you're with people that you trust and you can help keep each other safe. Um, each affinity group is going to have one representative. So we're going to have some spokes councils. The way that works is someone from every affinity group can uh, represent them in the big spokes council, but it's still sort of horizontal and federated and sort of an anarchistic model. Um, so everyone coming to Atlanta will have some input on what the final plan is. But um, these organizers, which we're calling now the Coalition to Block Cop City, um, it's a a bunch of organizers who've been involved since the beginning, some in Atlanta, um, some all over the country. Um, we've been meeting every week. We have a number of different working groups um, for various different parts of it, national outreach, um, housing, strategy planning, et cetera, and this tour that I'm currently on. Um, and we've been planning. And the, some of the details will be left up to the day because um, there's always going to be changing conditions on the ground, uh, but some have been planned for quite some time. So the basics are we're going to meet up early in the morning um, away from the construction site. We're going to split into a few different marches, depending how many people are there. And we're going to enter the construction site from a few different places. Then we're going to occupy the construction site all day long. Um, now, this is not meant to establish a new encampment. As I've said, I think that strategy has been exhausted for a few different reasons uh, at this point. But we're going to stay there all day. There's going to be a tree planting element because they've already cut down, uh, unfortunately, a little bit of the forest. So we're going to plant some trees to establish some new growth there. There's going to be community events. There might be some uh, music. And um, 
everyone's going to be trained in uh, de-escalation tactics beforehand. So this is really important. We're going to have two full days of trainings for nonviolent direct action tactics. So people will know what to do in various scenarios, depending what the cops do. Um, they'll be trained in de-escalation. They'll be trained in keeping each other safe. They'll be trained in, in standing together because a lot of the time when the really bad stuff goes down with the cops, it happens because people, uh, they scatter, they freak out and they scatter. Right. But if there's a large crowd, a large crew of people, like a thousand people in broad daylight with kids, with clergy, with the media watching, um, the cops are a lot less likely to try anything. Um, also, I think the state might even be realizing right now that they have overplayed their hand. Um, I should mention a different group of people, a different group of protesters who are also involved with the movement, um, the Faith Coalition Against Cop City. Um, five people from this group did a similar type of action recently on the construction site, a people's stop work order, if you will. Uh, and they got arrested, but they are all out on misdemeanor charges, which is generally the kind of charges that people get for protesting well, generally like yes yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah so yeah uh it's nice to see that different corners of the movement different people are sort of independently converging on this as the move right now and um i think it's going to help not just show how many people are opposed to cop city um you know demonstrate our power be a pain in their ass um and open up space for more actions, hopefully, because there's a lot of time still between November and March. Um, but we also hope it puts the state in a bit of a bind in terms of the charges that have already been levied and in terms of the charges that they're thinking of levying in the future. Because if you have uh, a thousand people doing a nonviolent direct action in the mold of MLK in Atlanta, you know, one of the birthplaces of civil rights. If you try to arrest a thousand people and charge them with terrorism for doing that, um, it would be an international outrage and throw the state into political crisis. And um, I don't think they're going to do that. Obviously, it's possible. Um, but if they say uh, charge people less, if they charge people with misdemeanors for the exact same thing that people have already been charged with terrorism for doing, um, that would also serve to delegitimize those charges for um, the people already facing them and anybody facing them now. So, yeah, that's that's the hope. Hundred percent strategy. Yeah, I I, I mean it, I I that's awesome to hear, and everyone can learn more about that element at uh, blockcopcity.org. Again, just plugging that if you want to help out or if you want to join, the information is there. Jamie, before we let you go, how can people like attend your your speech, uh, your speaking tour, and listen to you? Uh, what what do people need to know about that? Um, okay, one more point. Is that allowed? Yeah. Okay, yeah, of course. I just want to emphasize: we are not doing this. Uh, we're not choosing a nonviolent direct action right now in order to make the distinction between good protesters and bad protesters, right? right? This is a narrative that the state is trying to set forth. Um, we do not denounce any tactics in this fight. Um, the movement's strength has been its diversity of tactics so far. We're doing it because it feels strategic in this moment. Um, and that will feed into me answering your question. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jamie, so sorry, but just to jump in there. I just want to say like <clears throat> um, uh, Rico, uh, was uh, instituted the year after Fred Hampton died, but um, like th these sorts of legal attacks on protesters, this is how the state works, yeah. <laughs> right? Like th this is th this is how it knows how to deal with these sorts of movements that are uh, getting in the way of its initiative. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, all respect to everybody, um, you know, involved in these sorts of actions you're talking about, because this is, I mean, this is the sort of thing that we're going to be reading about <laughs> um, 50 years from yeah. now too. Thank you so much. And I really hope so. Um, yeah, what you said just reminded me, actually, the uh, the the date of the start of this conspiracy named in the RICO indictments was the date that George Floyd was murdered. Right. Now, uh, the, in, the plans for Cop City had not yet been announced then. So they are connecting it very explicitly to the movement against police and prisons that we saw um, come to the forefront in 2020. Right. Um, yeah, w w a good point there in connecting those things. Um, yeah, but so your, your speaking tour. Uh, yeah. Jamie, yeah. So this is very exciting right now. Um, 
I mean, one reason why we chose this kind of act that can be openly planned and promoted is so that we can go and talk to the maximum number of people possible. Um, I think, you know, there have been efforts in the past to engage people in the movement, but I think it seemed a little scary at times, especially when, um, you know, the mainstream media was trying to portray us as a bunch of, you know, eco-terrorists <laughs> or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, now I'm able to go out. We're able to go out um, all over the country and talk to groups of people, um, some of whom have been involved in organizing before, some of whom are undergrads in college who maybe this is the first thing they've ever done. Um, and we're giving people some history of the land they're trying to build Cop City on, some history of the movement and what's been done to oppose it. And then we're sort of uh, outlining this new phase of the movement, this new direct action that we're planning. Um, then we're having little affinity group workshops where we have some breakout discussions, we have Q and A's, and we invite everybody to, you know, at the end of the meeting, uh, give us your information and we'll be in touch and help you with whatever you need um, to form an affinity group and come to Atlanta, November 10th to 13th. So we're hitting, right. yeah, we're hitting 70 cities across the country as well as um, one in Mexico and one in Canada. So it's a North American tour. And um, I'm doing the whole Northeast pretty much. Other <laughs> people are doing other places. So yeah, it's been really exciting so far. And um, if you want to come out to an event, you can go to blockcopcity.org slash tour. And that is a really good place to, uh, you know, meet your friendly representative from Block Cop <laughs> City and get plugged in. Well, uh, love it, Jamie. So good to hear from you. And so, you know, good to see you doing some of this work. You know, we've had activists on here before, but it makes total sense that you're involved. Uh, really appreciate it that we will uh, be in touch. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. For sure. All right. Uh, with that, guys, we're going to wrap up the free part of this program and head into the fun half where we will take your calls, maybe one or two, because we are uh, we went a little. Yeah, over. don't count on it today, guys. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. We're also tired. I yeah. mean, we did a monster. Sh we, we, I, we just did a three guests. We did three two guests, guests yesterday and, and then the whole uh, debate thing where we had to subject ourselves to some of the worst people on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, tough. It's yeah. tough. It's hard out here for podcasters. We can't, OK. Um, Thank you for speaking while I'm interrupting. Brian, you're down. <laughs> you're, you're, you're Bradley down. just said something with his whole chest that was not audible. <laughs> <laughs> that was certainly uh, said with emphasis. Sorry, audience, we're unable to hear Bradley's joke. Um, I, I pulled the Bergam. You did. You I, did. I burgamed. Yeah, you burgamentumed <laughs> all over the place. Um, I, we on ESPN today will be doing our picks against the spread, and we'll be talking a bit about that that, that little old trade. Sending Damian Lillard to the box, youtube.com slash ESPN show. I mean, <clears throat> I'm kind of enjoying the Miami fan cope, but uh, that's beside the point. Matt. Yeah, I did say I, I did play a, um, a, a few hours of 2K last night after getting home um, just to try out the uh, Lillard on um, the Milwaukee Bucks, and turns out it works pretty well. Okay. Uh, to have I, a guy I, that shoots threes and uh, Giannis <clears throat> on the same team. On paper, they are the best team in the East for sure, right? And also, make sure you talk about how I called it in December. And I will I make said, sure. Uh, you know, upon watching a, um, a interview with Lillard on a GQ, that oh, this guy's going to go to uh, Milwaukee. But I don't know why Bender and um, Brandon, Brandon aren't, aren't showing up. Let's see here. Okay, I will make sure to lead with you being right. Okay, Thank I mean you. Um, that's what's important here, Matt. Though, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Like, oh, on, on the left reckoning, we got. Uh, we'll get to you in a second, Bender. Um, hey, <laughs> um, hey. <laughs> um, uh, left reckoning. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, Jacob from the Valley Labor Report on to talk about the UAW strike, um, the different, the the sort of way the strategies uh, working, and uh, why certain people might be being a little bit premature in uh, criticizing the UAW for maybe um, internet related clout, uh, and. Uh, uh, this weekend, talking to the Vanguard uh, boys about the uh, primary and maybe some uh, billionaire money going around independent media. So uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning to get access to that. All right. We have our friends here, Brandon and Matt Bender. Whoa, look at that. And they appear. Hello, guys. Hello. 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 And what is happening on the discourse, Brandon? We will have a new episode for Are You Out uh, tomorrow or Saturday. We were able to get together and talk about the debate uh, and the path forward for the Democrats and also the sort of impending insurance crisis going on across our great country. 
mm. uh, house insurance, not health insurance. Um, and uh, Binder, what's happening on Scam Economy and Doomed and Leftist Mafia? Well, we we also the the le the leftist mafia crew along with uh, Ben Dixon got together and did a uh, debate stream as well. So that's this week's episode of my show. And then tonight will be the normal leftist mafia gathering where um oh I should say Letter Hack joined us yesterday too. Uh, shout out to Letter Hack. Um, and then tonight will be uh the you know, the the regular week in review from the leftist mafia crew. You can check it all out at youtubecom slash Bender. Mm. All right, check all that out. Uh, I'm making an executive decision that we will not be taking calls today. We will be reading your IMs. Um, the coup. This yes. is the new coup uh, environment post Sam. Yes, uh, get used to it. I rule with an iron fist. We're cutting the phone lines. Well, actually, we're just not logging in. Yeah, but it's more dramatic that way. The number is, you don't need to know it. We're going to read your IMs and head into the fun half and do some clips. Bye-bye. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Oh no! Oh no! Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, is back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a wow! What a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. Bring back DJ Denner. Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like forty-five seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. Oh, yeah. That's fucking nonsense. You see white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflakes says what? What 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 matter <laughs> have you tried doing an impression on a college campus I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this psych and the alpha males are back 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 and the africans are black 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 african and the alpha males are black 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 and the africans are back 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 when you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back, back. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. What? What? Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy.